welcome to the Benalla Talk. Uh, for everyone's information, this will be moderated by Andrea Cosalan and also Arturo, a student. Uh, Andrea is a lecturer in the archaeological studies program. She's also worked in a lot of uh, uh, research, and she is interested in doing uh, in in studying bones as well. And she'll she'll you, you can see her expertise later. And Arturo uh, is also a student in the archaeological studies program. So take it away. Hi and good morning, everyone. So um, our speaker for today. Um, it is actually one of the newest additions to the UPASP faculty. She has a long bony history in the sense that she's equipped with a bachelor's in bioanthropology um, from the University of Alberta, um, a master's in human osteology and paleopathology from the University of Bradford, and a PhD in anthropology and archaeology from Durham University with two po postdoc positions um, at the Simon Fraser University and a Marie Curie European Fellowship at the University of Liverpool. And apart from these, she's also active in the science communication scene, which is an advocacy that is very close to many of us. Um, among her initiatives um, is a podcast called Screens of the Stone Age, where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. I know a lot of people in the audience, um, they have Spotify, or rather they, they listen to Spotify, so you can access it through there. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to formally introduce Dr. Kimberly Plum as she discusses bipedalism, back pain, and paleopathology. Dr. Plum? Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Hello, everybody. I look forward to meeting you all in person, hopefully soon. Uh, the talk I'm going to give today is one that um, a project that I've been working on for probably over 10 years now, um, started in my PhD. It's kind of my, my passion project, and I hope to continue it and keep it going. Um, essentially, it's bipedalism, back pain, and paleopathology. So back pain is a really common condition in humans. Um, it's listed as one of the top reasons for visiting a doctor, second only to the common cold, and one of the most common reasons reported for missing work. Um, it costs economies billions of dollars a year in direct and indirect costs. And so it's a significant health issue uh, for modern people. However, despite how important it is for our lives right now, uh, the pathogenesis, so what causes it, and the etiology, um, the reasons behind it, of a lot of back issues that we have, we still don't we still don't really know what causes them. So if you go to a doctor with back pain, a lot of the times you might get told you have a herniated disc or you have something torn, but they don't know why or how you got it. Um, and there's not much they can do to help you about that. So it can be quite discouraging to go to the doctor for back pain sometimes. Something that's quite interesting is that humans seem to be unique in how much back pain we get. So if you were to look at a population of non-human apes, say chimpanzees or gorillas, um, compare it to a group of adult humans, modern humans, and you're looking for a condition, say, um, intervertebral disc herniation, which I'll discuss more later. Uh, in humans, it can happen in about 50% of people in the population. So if you looked at any general population, you're going to find it anywhere from 20 to 50, 60% of people have that condition. In chimpanzees or gorillas in a population, you're going to find two to 4%, maybe five have um, that condition. So there's a huge difference in how much spinal problems we have as a species. Now, for decades, people have said that the reason why we seem to be so prone to back problems is likely because we walk on two legs. So the way that we walk on two legs is quite unique um, in animals. And our ancestors and us are the only ones to walk on two legs the way that we do. So there are other animals that walk on two legs like kangaroos and birds, but we have a special way of doing it. And what makes us special is that we actually carry all of our weight over our hips and knees so our and our spine. So our spine holds all of our weight. And anytime you take a step or you move, there's going to be movement and pressure on the spine. And so some people have said for decades that it could be that this adaptation to walk on two legs 
made us at more at risk for back problems. Um, and although this was kind of this was accepted as a good idea, it hasn't really hadn't really been tested. In my PhD, I found that the shape of vertebrae, uh, so the two dimensional shape. So I just used photographs for this paper. The two dimensional shape of vertebrae, human vertebrae, seemed to correlate with whether you had a disc herniation or not. And I'll go into disc herniation in a moment. So I was able to say, well, with looking at the shape of someone's vertebrae, I was able to say with about 70 to 90% accuracy, whether that person would have disc herniation or not. So the relationship between the shape of the vertebrae and whether you have this condition is quite strong. So a disc herniation is what happens. You might've known people who have it. It's, it's quite common. And what it is, is that in between your vertebrae, so the bones of your spine, is a soft tissue disc, and it's called the intervertebral disc, and it sits between the bodies of your vertebrae, so that when you move, it has soft tissue to move around with, like a joint. Otherwise, it would just be bone on bone, and you wouldn't be able to move your spine very well, and the bone would break down. So this soft tissue allows for your spine to be mobile. It has um, cartilaginous fibrous layers, around it, but in the middle, it has what's called a nucleus pulposus. It's like a gel-like substance, so like a hair gel type of substance in the middle of it. And that's what causes it to be able to move and adjust as, as you're moving around. You can think of it like a, a partially inflated tire or something so that you can move it so it squishes around. So what happens with a herniated disc is that this nucleus pulposus pushes out of the intervertebral disc. If it pushes out into the spinal canal, so if it pushes vertically, that can be really painful because the nucleus pulposus will pinch, it'll push and pinch the spinal cord causing pain. If it herniates is up or down into the vertebral bodies, it can leave these depressions on the vertebral bodies here that are called Schmoll's nodes. So bone will resorb and eat itself away where it doesn't, where there's pressure. It doesn't want any kind of pressure or infection or anything bugging it. So as soon as that pressure of that fluid hits the bone and is building up and going against the bone, the bone is just gonna eat away at itself to make that depression, to make room for this new soft tissue. And we can see this in archeology. span These Schmorl's nodes are identify, identifiable in, in human remains. <clears throat> So I was wondering in my PhD, why would there be such a strong correlation between vertebral shape and the presence of these conditions? And so that's what I wanted to test with my postdoc. So I thought, since there's this hypothesis that walking on two legs being bipedal causes these back problems, and we find this correlation with this um, disc problem and the shape of vertebrae, maybe it's the shape of our vertebrae and our evolutionary adaptations of the vertebrae to be able to walk on two legs that can be that explanatory factor between humans, bipedalism and back problems. So it could be the mechanism or part of the mechanism of why um, our spines seem to be at risk of de developing these conditions. So I did a similar study for my first project. So I used the two-dimensional landmarks again so these same ones, I took photographs of vertebrae of um, humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans. And the humans were people with and without Schmoll's nodes. Then I used geometric morphometrics, which are statistical shape analyses. I don't know how much of a background you guys have in these. I'm not going to go over the methods too much right now, but definitely um, if any of you are interested in learning the methods or using them for your, your own research, um, I'm more than happy to teach you and show you how to do them. So geometric morphometrics, what it does is it takes these landmarks, so two-dimensional or three-dimensional, it doesn't really matter, it's kind of all the same, and it has coordinates, takes coordinates for each landmark that you choose, so each dot that I've chosen to represent to be able to capture the shape of the vertebrae. And if you um, have a background in math, or if you remember from math in, in um, before university, if you remember the X and the Y graphing points, so there would be a coordinate for X and a coordinate for Y, and then knowing those coordinates, you could plot a point on the graph. So it's similar like that. So each of these points has an X and a Y coordinate for two dimensions. If you're going to do three dimensional, it has X, Y, and Z coordinate. 
And so what it does is it takes all these coordinates and then you run a statistics on it and it wants to look for the actual shape difference between the vertebrae. So first I would do generalized procrustes analysis. Generalized procrustes analysis, it gets its name from the Greek myth of procrustes. And so procrustes was this guy who lived in a house. Um, and if you came to visit him, he would invite you to stay overnight, but you had to sleep in whatever bed he gave you. And if he gave you a bed that was too long for you and it didn't fit because it was too long, he would stretch out your body um, on like one of those horrible medieval devices where they tie your arms and legs and they stretch you out um, until you fit the bed. If the bed was too short for you, he would chop off parts of your body until you fit the bed. So this is a, a, a Greek myth and that's where the name Procrustes comes from. So essentially what this test does is it takes away any of the information about location or rotation. So say if I had a picture of a vertebrae like this, but it was the vertebrae wasn't aligned properly, so it was a bit twisted. Generalized Procrustes analysis is going to get rid of all of that. And all it's going to do is look at the actual difference between every landmark one, every landmark two, every landmark three, so that what we end up with is just the sh actual shape of the vertebrae. And we can get rid of size as well. So we don't, we don't necessarily need size in our equation. Um, and so once that's what generalized procrustes does is it just gets rid of all that information that you don't necessarily want when you want to just look at shape. Then I used regression analysis to minimize the influence of size on shape. So allometry. Um, that allometry is the relationship of shape that changes with size. So from the shape of a female gorilla to a male gorilla, they're going to have standard shape changes that occur because of the shop size difference of the animal. That's called allometry. Now, because I'm looking at different body sized animals, humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans, I didn't want body size to be a factor in this. So I just removed it from the data. I then took this data that's now it's called superimposed data. And I ran a principal components analysis. So principal components analysis is going to look at the shape variation. So if I put in all the information for the vertebrae in it, it's gonna look at it all. And it's gonna say, this is what, this is the biggest difference in the sample. This is the second biggest difference in the sample. This is the third biggest difference. And it's gonna show me what those are. And I'll show you guys the PCA results in a moment. Then I use pairwise MANOVAs, which are multivariate analysis of variation. So similar to an ANOVA, but this but you can use multiple, multiple variables. Um, and that's just going to look for a p-value for significance. So are, th are the differences in relationships that we're seeing between the vertebrae si statistically significant or not? So th this is the results of my first two-dimensional study. This is a principal components chart. So the x-axis here describes the largest amount of shape variation occurring in this sample. So the blue rectangles are orangutan vertebrae. The green triangles are chimpanzees. The yellow circles are healthy human vertebrae. And the red circles are ver human vertebrae with Schmoll's nodes, so with the intervertebral disc herniation. So we can see that the what explains the most variation, the biggest difference in this sample, is the difference between orangutan and chimpanzee vertebrae, so the great ape vertebrae, and the healthy human vertebrae. So that makes sense. They're different species. They use different locomotion. That's what we would expect. Principal component two describes the second amount of shape variation. Now, what's interesting about these findings is that we have the chimpanzee and orangutan vertebrae grouping out on the negative end of principal component one. And the humans tend to be grouping on the positive end. But interestingly enough, the individuals with the disc herniation are grouping more on the end with the great hum, uh, the non-human ape vertebrae. So it's not complete. There are in healthy individuals grouping over there too, but we don't have individuals with Schmoll's nodes grouping all the way at the end of PC1. So there's this trend of a relationship in a shape. As you get closer to a shape of vertebrae similar to the great ape vertebrae, your likelihood of getting disc herniation increases. Then I ran a canical variance analysis or CVA. Now CVA is very similar to principal components analysis. So it's the same thing whereas on the X axis here, we have the greatest amount of variation explained and this Y axis, we have the second amount of variation explained. But the difference is, is that before I put the data into a CVA, I tell it what groups I want. 
So this is kind of like the cleanest, best representation of your of your data that you're going to get. A principal components analysis, I haven't told it what is what, so it doesn't know which which vertebra is grade eight, which vertebra is human. But a CVA, it does know. So it's kind of it maximizes the between group differences in relation to the within group distance. So it's the best case scenario for your for your um, data. So if you ever read a paper and they're presenting CVA results for geometric morphometrics, but not a PCA, you have to be suspicious because you can have a PCA that shows you nothing interesting and a really nice CVA. Um, so you want to make sure that you're seeing both in papers. But what this shows is it really illustrates the relationship between the humans with small nodes in red again, and how they're completely completely overlapping with their great eight vertebrae while the healthy human vertebrae are grouping away. So this has exaggerated this difference so we can really see what's happening. As for a p-value, so for statistics, we find that the difference between all of these groups, so if I compared healthy humans with orangutans, healthy humans with chimpanzees, chimpanzees with orangutans, they're all statistically significantly different. So statistically, we can identify which one is orangutan, which one is chimpanzee, which one is healthy human. But the comparison between humans with the intervertebral disc herniation and chimpanzees is not statistically significant. So that's telling me that if I were to just base it on vertebral shape and statistics, I can't tell whether that ver vertebrae is a human with a small nodes or a chimpanzee vertebrae. So I got really excited when I saw these results years ago. Um, I ran it about 10 times because I thought, no, 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 it can't actually be my, you know, as I predicted. Um, and so I wanted to test it with better, met better methods, different methods. So I wanted to use three-dimensional this time. So still the same idea, comparing humans, healthy human vertebrae, human vertebrae with small nodes to grade eight vertebrae. But this time I wanted to do it in three dimension. So I wanted to grab more data, more information about the vertebrae to see if this, this relationship that I found in two dimensions holds up in three dimensions. I also was able to get some hominin vertebrae. So I have hominin vertebrae from Australopithecus sediba, Africanus, Paranthropus robustus, Homonoleti, and Homo neanderthalensis. This time I took orangutans out because they weren't the ones that were interesting at this point. So I just decided to keep it with chimpanzees to try and keep the, the results simple. And it also makes sense because chimpanzees are our closest living relatives. So we, we are more closely related to chimpanzees than either of us are to orangutans. So what I wanted to do with this third, with this second um, analysis was to test the ancestral shape hypothesis. So the ancestral shape hypothesis we stated was that the reason why we're finding this relationship between humans with intervertebral disc herniation and chimpanzees vertebrae is that within normal var human variation, so there's nothing abnormal happening, but within normal human variation, you're gonna have this spectrum of morphology and traits. And there's going to be the average individual who probably is quite well adapted for bipedalism, but you're always going to have people who have shaped traits that are more ancestral. So they retain some of the ancestral traits. Since us and chimpanzees share a last common ancestor before our, home, before our ancestors became bipedal, um, and we don't share any locomotion between them between us and them so they walk on they use knuckle walking we use bipedalism so there's no reason why we'd have convergent evolution for function in our vertebrae so i reasoned that the shape of the vertebrae with small nodes is probably ancestral so the shape trends traits that we share in common with chimpanzees is probably related to our our ancestral history with them rather than anything shared with locomotion so to test that with this three-dimensional data, I set out three predictions. One is that the human vertebrae with the intervertebral disc herniation should be closer again to ch ch chimpanzee vertebrae than are the healthy human vertebrae. So can we find that same pattern that we found with two-dimensional data with the three-dimensional data? The second prediction is that the human vertebrae with um, 
intervertebral disc herniation are going to be closer to the early hominins. So if this is ancestral traits that we're identifying, we should identify them in the early hominins as well. They should almost be stronger in the early hominins than later humans. And the third prediction was that we thought homo neanderthalensis, so neanderthals, we thought because they were a later hominin, they should be grouping with the healthy humans. So they should be, have already uh, had their own adaptations for bipedalism at that point. So this is the three-dimensional data. This is a principal component chart again. The x-axis is principal component one, so that explains the most amount of variation in the sample. The y-axis this time is principal component three, but that, that's fine. So principal component one explains 19.7% of the shape variance. Principal component three uh, explains 7.3. And what we see is the same trend of healthy human vertebrates in yellow. So the larger circles and triangle, those are the group means. So sometimes it's just easier to plot the group means so you can see it better. Um, are on the positive end of PC1, chimpanzees are on the negative end, and we have the human vertebrae with Schmolz nodes grouping intermediately again. So they, again, we see this trend of those with Schmolz nodes tending to be in the middle between healthy human vertebrae and great ape vertebrae. When we look at the statistics for it, we find a similar trend that we did with the two-dimensional data, where all comparisons are significant significantly different except for the one between the pathological humans and the chimpanzees. So again, based on three-dimensional shape, you can't tell the difference between a human vertebrae with Schmolz nodes and a human or, and a chimpanzee vertebrae. But the difference between healthy human vertebrae and vertebrae with Schmolz nodes is significant. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so this was for the 11th thoracic, we find the same thing in the final thoracic. We're seeing the same pattern and the same um, results with the statistics as of it being non-significant with the pathological human versus chimpanzee comparison. And in the first lumbar, we're finding this again. So it kind of, at this point, feels like no matter what I throw at it, we're seeing this pattern. So it seems to be real. It's not a blip in my choice of landmarks, not a blip in my, um, this population of the sample I chose, this seems to be real and it seems to be happening throughout the spine from the lower um, thoracic to the lumbar. In terms of the hominin vertebrae, we had all of the pathological human vertebrae with the disc herniation were closer in shape to the extinct hominin vertebrae, except for one pesky robustus specimen um, that was grouping out strangely. Uh, when I looked into it, th this one specimen has questions about it, about whether it actually belongs to Paranthropus or not. So it might be that it's a different animal, um, but we're not sure. So we just know that it wasn't grouping. The interesting thing is that the Neanderthals actually grouped with the pathological humans. So they didn't group with the, with the healthy humans, they grouped with the pathological humans. So if we go back to the predictions, prediction one was correct. The human vertebrae with Schmolz nodes were closer to chimpanzee vertebrae. Second prediction was correct in that the pathological human vertebrae were closer to those early hominins, but we were un incorrect with where we thought Neanderthals would fit in this. The interesting thing is that one of the main shape differences, so we can see these wire frames, these images of the vertebrae, and I have them on the ends of the principal components because those are actually the shapes that relate to, so this shape of the vertebrae is what relates to where the star is right here. And on the other side, we have the similar thing. So this vertebrae, the shape of the vertebrae would be here on principal component one. So essentially what we're doing is highlighting, this would be a um, exaggerated chimpanzee vertebrae. And this is an exaggerated healthy human vertebrae. One of the main shape differences that we see that occurs as we move along principal component one from chimpanzee to healthy human is this change in the wedging of the vertebral body. So the vertebral body of a thoracic vertebrae in humans, um, or sorry, first lumbar vertebrae, typically stays, has the front part of the vertebral body is about the same height as the back part. Whereas in chimpanzees, the front part is lower. And this is what causes their curve of their spine. So humans have an S-shaped curve. So we have a lardotic cervical. So if you see the curve of the spine that goes backwards, um, 
like this, if this is the front of the spine, it goes back. That is lordosis. We move into the thoracic where we have a kyphotic, kyphosis um, curve. And then in the lumbar, we curve back again. And that's called the lumbar lordosis. And it's those curves of the spine is what allows our spines to hold our body above our hips, our knees and our feet. That enables us to walk on two legs. Chimpanzees and other great apes have more of a C shape or straight spine. So that's why their vertebrae are wedged because it's always pulling them forward. Ours tries to make it so that it goes forward, back and forward so that we can stand up straight. This helps with our center of gravity. So these circles here in the middle of the, of the chimpanzee's stomach and then our hips, that's our center of gravity. So when you stand on two legs, the lumbar lordosis, this curvature of the lumbar spine here, our lower spine, pulls our center of gravity over our hips, knees, and feet. That's what allows us to stand and have uh, straight backs. Chimpanzees' center of gravity is up in their stomach and chest. So even when they can stand on two legs, they can only do so for a short period of time because gravity is always going to pull their chest forward. This is what makes the human bipedalism unique. So kangaroos and birds, they have... Um, their center of gravity is up higher as well. Same with the chimpanzees. So they have different uh, body structures to be able to walk on two legs. So this is what makes human spines unique is having this lumbar lordosis here. Interestingly, in clinical studies, looking at disc herniation and disc degeneration, people have found that individuals with disc herniation and degenerative disc disease tend to have smaller lordotic spines. So they have less curved spines and they're straighter. That corresponds to what we're seeing here with this straight um, human spine. So an average human lordosis angle, which is calculated um, the angle that it makes if you were to draw an angle. I'm sorry, I should have had a figure for this. If you were to draw um, perpendicular lines from the top of the lumbar vertebrae and the bottom of the lumbar vertebrae, the angle that that makes, it can be, if it's a strong lordotic angle, it's gonna be a large angle. If it's a smaller lordotic angle, it's gonna be a small angle. So the smaller angles are associated with disc herniation, disc disease. Modern humans, typically we have a lumbar lordosis angle of 51 degrees. There's a lot of variation in modern humans. So it's not, it's not everybody's at 51 degrees. There's a lot of variation, but humans typically have about, about 50 degree um, herniation. Humans with disc herniations seem to have a lot lower. So some people have found disc herniations. We saw on the other side at about 40 degrees. And this one is about 37 degrees. So that's quite a bit smaller of an angle than healthy humans. As for hominins, Africanus, Australopithecus Africanus has been estimated to have a lordosis angle of 43 degrees. So that's similar to humans with the disc degeneration. And Neanderthals, there's two groups of people arguing over this right now. One group has found that they had a 29 degree lumbar lordosis. Another group found that they had 55 degree. So it's quite interesting that there might be a huge amount of variation in Neanderthals too. And that might help explain why they were grouping with the pathological humans rather than the healthy humans if they have a different um, degree of lordosis than us. So all of this supports the idea of the ancestral shape hypothesis. So the traits that we're actually seeing associated with disc de degeneration, which is the smaller lordotic angle, we can see in the fossil record. Um, and so that helps support this idea that the traits that we're identifying are actually ancestral. So the ancestral shape hypothesis, just to sum it up, it supports that disc herniations may be, at least in part, due to vertebral morphology, including a smaller lordotic angle. Um, it may represent the shape that we're identifying so that we call the ancestral shape. It might be a shape that's less well adapted to withstand the stresses on the spine during bipedalism, increase, and then increasing that person's risk of developing this condition. There's going to be other factors come into play, whether someone's going to get disc herniation or not, like activity and diet and genetics. But we're thinking that this might actually be one of the important causes. 
So when I was finished with that study, I thought, okay, if we have an ancestral vertebral shape, what happens on the other side? If we can assume that that healthy human vertebrae are the average, what happens on the other side? Because it's a spectrum, remember? So anytime there's a spectrum, there's one end. So you have the ancestral end. What about the other end of human um, evolution? So the end where people have um, hyper-derived traits. And so I wanted to think about a, a condition or a spinal condition that could fit in that. And what that condition is, is spondylolysis. It's a big word, but it's kind of fun to say. It's more fun than Schmoll's nodes. And what that is, is a fracture of your lower vertebrae. So it's usually on your fifth or fourth lumbar vertebrae, the very bottom of your back. And what happens is, is that you get fatigue fractures. So if you keep hitting the same spot over and over, just in the same way that a, a glass at a pub is going to eventually break because it's got tiny micro fractures in it forever. And then you finally, you put it down a little bit too hard on the table and it shatters. It wasn't that you're Hulk and you broke the glass. It was that that glass had been beaten up so much throughout for years that it had so many micro fractures that it was just waiting for one more pressure before it snapped. And so this is similar with the back of the spine, micro fractures accumulating in this area over and over and over as you're moving, eventually it breaks and it causes spondylolysis, which is a fracture of the back part of the vertebrae broken off from the front part of the vertebrae. And we can recognize this in um, archaeological skeletons. And it's quite common today, especially in young gymnasts, because they're moving their backs in different angles and they're doing quite a lot of jumping and flipping and all that. Um, and it can be painful. Other studies, previous studies, have found that spondylolysis seems to occur most commonly in individuals with a large lordotic angle. So where your lumbar spine is extra curved. And that is thought um, to be because as the lumbar spine curves more, you can picture it that increased curvature is going to cause less spacing in between um, the posterior bits of the vertebrae. So as it's squishing down like this, you're going to squish the back part of the vertebrae together. That's going to cause more pressure as they hit each other more often, leading to spondylolysis. So it makes sense functionally why a pronounced lumbar lordosis would fit, uh, would cause spondylolysis. So what I wanted to do was test to see if spondylolysis would have an interesting relationship with um, vertebral vertebrae of non-human apes. So I predicted, oh, sorry. So the sample that I used was humans with spondylolysis, humans with small nodes, intervertebral disc herniation, healthy humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. I used three-dimensional landmarks to capture the shape of the vertebrae without the back part of the vertebrae. And I tested three predictions again. So the first one, my first prediction is that the average shape of the human final lumbar lordosis or lumbar vertebrae, sorry, that's L5 with spondylolysis is going to be significantly different from the shape of healthy human vertebrae. So that's the first thing is, can, is there a shape difference? Can we identify the difference in shape between people with spondylolysis and healthy human vertebrae? Prediction two is that the healthy human vertebrae should be closer in shape to great apes than are those with spondylysis. So that's the opposite of what, I'm, what I predicted with Schmoll's nodes. So because I thought that the disc herniation was related to an ancestral shapes, I thought they'd be closer to chimpanzees. And um, with spondylolysis, because it has a more pronounced lordosis, which is a bi adaptation for bipedalism, I thought that individuals with spondylysis would be grouping farther away from great apes and healthy human vertebrae. And then my third prediction was that the individuals with disc herniation is going to group intermediately, or sorry, um, closer to great apes, so that the healthy human vertebrae are going to be grouping intermediately. So I thought that if I could find that pattern, it would help this support my argument that these um, shapes that we're identifying are related to evolutionary adaptations for bipedalism. So this first plot is a principal components graph again. We have gorilla vertebrae in the orange triangles, chimpanzee vertebrae in the green, sorry, orange diamonds. Green triangles are the chimpanzee vertebrae 
and the blue rectangles are orangutan. We have yellow healthy human vertebrae again, and the red circles are human vertebrae with spondylolysis. And we can see if we plot the group means that those individuals with spondylolysis are grouping farther from the great apes than are the healthy human vertebrae. Okay, so that makes sense. When I look at the distance, so I measure the distance of each vertebrae from each other, from the group mean, those with spondylolysis are continuously farther apart from the great ape vertebrae than are the healthy human vertebrae. So principal component charts, they only show us two dimensions of multi-dimensional data. So that's just principal component one, principal component two, but I'm analyzing maybe 20, 30 principal components. So you don't, you're not getting all the information when you look at a principal components part chart. It's just to show, it's just to give you an idea of where to start your interpretations. But the distances based on all of the data is telling us that consistently humans with spondylysis are farther away in, in terms of shape from non-human ape vertebrae than our healthy human vertebrae. When I included the individuals with Schmoll's nodes, um, we can see the group means here, they are grouping a bit closer to the grade eight vertebrae than the healthy human vertebrae. It's not that much of a difference, um, but it is, it is happening. And again, um, looking at the distance, this is looking at all the data, not just the two dimensions of the principal components. Um, the distance between humans with the disc herniation or Schmoltz nodes are closer to the great human or uh, non-human ape vertebrae than our healthy human vertebrae. So the distances are also showing me this pattern that I expected to see. And this is just a simplified illustration. So you can see it that the farthest from chimpanzee vertebrae in terms of shape are those with spondylolysis. The closest are those with disc herniation and the middle one is the healthy vertebrae. So this is exactly how the pattern that I was hoping to find. And if we look at the actual shape differences that we're seeing, so this is a first lumbar vertebrae of humans with, um, sorry, the fifth lumbar vertebrae. So because I didn't run the fifth lumbar vertebrae on my other uh, analyses with um, just small notes, I wanted just to make sure that the shape differences that we're seeing related to the lumbar lordosis. And so if you look at this chart, we have chimpanzees on the left side, healthy humans on the right side, those with intervertebral disc herniation in the middle. And we're seeing that what the main shape difference that we see is related to that vertebral wedging. So the healthy humans have a greater vertebral wedging, lordotic wedging, where the back of the vertebrae is shorter than the front of the vertebrae. And that shape is what causes the curve of the lumbar spine, giving us the lumbar lordosis. The, the eight, grade eight vertebrae don't have that need. They don't have lordosis. So their vertebrae are going to be either flat or curved at the front. And so what that's telling us is that even in the fifth lumbar vertebrae, the people with disc herniation seem to have um, less of a lordosis, so a straighter spine than healthy human vertebrae. So this is all adding up to supporting this idea that these are linked with bipedal adaptations for um, in our spine and in particular lumbar lordosis. So to go over the predictions, first one was right, we could find it um, a difference between healthy human vertebrae and those with spondylolysis. Second one was right in that we did find that humans with spondylolysis were closer to grade eight vertebrae and the individuals with small, small zones were still the closest. So to visualize this, uh, we came up with this image um, for what we think the, the spectrum looks like. So if you picture this bell graph here, this bell chart, as the evolutionary spectrum of human vertebral shape variation. We have the one end which overlaps with the chimpanzee very, um, vertebral variation. So that's gonna be the ancestral end. And if you have vertebrae that have shape traits on this end, you may be more prone to disc herniation and you likely have a small lumbar lordosis or straighter spine. If you're on the other end, the one that's farthest away from great apes, you likely have a hyper-derived hyper or more pronounced um, evolutionary adaptations for bipedalism. So you've kind of overshot the mark. That's why we called it the overshoot hypothesis. Um, and that might make you more prone to spondylolysis and you probably have a more pronounced lumbar lordosis. 
So overall, we've called it the evolutionary shape hypothesis for an umbrella term for all of these hypotheses with this idea that where your vertebrae sit within the spectrum in terms of shape probably has um, an important influence on the health of your spine. Um, I would like to test this next with vertebrae from living people in clinical studies to see if we can actually use th these methods, geometric morphometrics and landmarks I can use on CT images. Um, so keep that in mind for your research. We can do it on CT images or anything like that. Um, so I, I will be able to, if I get access to these um, scans, I would be able to put all of my data together. So all throughout human history, the hominin data, great ape data and modern human CT data together to see if we can identify other shapes that might predispose people to other conditions like osteoarthritis um, and hopefully to be able to test how having different shape vertebrae actually affects your, your gait, your locomotion, um, your stride, and how we can relate that to keeping people uh, and their spine healthy. And overall, one of the main parts of my career is to try and integrate paleopathology with evolutionary medicine. So there's that great quote that's from somebody famous that says, nothing in biology makes sense except in the context of evolution. And many people believe it's the same with medicine and evolutionary medicine, um, which is investigating human health conditions with an evolutionary perspective is gaining prominence in the medical community. And I think us as archeologists are in a prime spot to be able to help with that because we have access to human health throughout human history. And um, so that's one of my main goals. And I think this project really illustrates how paleopathological data can actually be used as to help us understand a health condition that still affects us today. And that's my presentation. Any questions? I hope I didn't speak too fast. I know I get on a roll and I, I speak quite fast. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plump. Um, do we have any questions from the audience or any comments? Because um, I, I know a lot of people could relate to the topic in the sense of, of back pain. <laughs> That's why yes, we have a lot too. of people doing yoga and whatnot <laughs> to alleviate it. Um, yes. Any questions? Yeah, uh, I think we have a question right here by uh, Ma'am Grace, uh, currently in the chat. So I'll read it aloud uh, so that everyone can hear it. Uh, hi, Kim. I interesting talk. Oh, wait, never mind. That's a comment, not a question. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um... I have. Uh, oh, serving. Go ahead. Hello, Kim. Thanks for the talk. Oh, fascinating. I caught it most. Of I was in a meet another meeting, no, simultaneous, but that's that's over. But what's fascinating about this, for, and maybe you can give us your opinion, is that um, okay? So statistically, and you know, in reality, we you have demonstrated that there's some materiality behind uh, what we call what I would call a factory defect. You know, some people are susceptible to back aches and back pains and back problems than others. Uh, do you think that's associated with um, uh, and this actually? Um, demonstrates also supports um, um, punctuated equilibrium uh, in, in the sense mm -hmm. that uh, it, uh, this evolutionary process was uh, quite quick rather than slow. And therefore, you do have this kind of uh, side effect, or at least the, you have this kind of, uh, of uh, population. The second part will be, um, have you heard of the coccyx, uh, the tail, you know, the tail uh, uh, folklore or or, or uh, recorded uh, for some no they they've recorded people with so called tails no and <laughs> and in the philippines at the turn of the century they did uh, record a couple of people and they usually associate there's some a lot of sociological and uh, and you know colonial thinking there but um, but there are images no and in in old uh, where the cock they have an extended cock no? so um so that, that's connected again with this idea that is this an, a quick evolutionary process rather than a, a slow one? Yeah, yeah definitely. That's, that's a good point. So in the fossil record, so we split from chimpanzees um, based on genetic data, probably about 
six to eight million years ago. Um, and we have evidence in the fossil record by about 4.4 million years that bipedalism was already being used, probably not exactly like us, and those individuals were still able to move in trees, but bipedalism had started to evolve. So that's a very short time evolutionary for such a giant change in the shape of our skeleton and, and the function of our locomotion. So um, it was really quick. And until we get more fossils of that time, we can't really say exactly what happened. Um, we don't even know what locomotion the last common ancestor between us and chimpanzees had, which kind of hampers some of our interpretations. Uh, we don't know if there were knuckle walkers like chimpanzees or if they were um, moved in the trees like monkeys. Um, so that really, it's hard, it's hard to say, but yeah, it's an interesting point with the punctuated equilibrium. Something happened very quickly that made us evolve this very quickly. And then it makes sense that um, we may not be ideally adapted for it still. Like there still may be problems because it happens so quickly. And back pain is not something that necessarily will stop you from reproducing. Yes. So it's not going to be selected out of our lineage. Well, just right? look at me. I'm wearing a brace now. See, when I sit down, <laughs> yes. because <laughs> yes. I cannot sit anymore long yes. without having a back, my back aching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I, I, my <laughs> tummy is big now, but. Uh, but <laughs> no, I think most people have back pain at some point. Um, and yeah, about the tail, that's really interesting. I mean, it's it makes sense that we would have residual tails. And I think it's more common than we know. It usually I think gets just removed at birth, uh, residual tails. Um, we are primates, so it makes sense. But yeah, it would be interesting to uh, see those spines. So I've never seen one in person. Yeah, But have you seen a picture of it? There's one um, uh, in the, yeah. uh, it's, it's actually an Ifugao. Uh, yeah. Sure. But uh, yeah. But again, most of it is social rather than uh, biological. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, if anyone has any other questions that they like to pose pose to Dr. Plum, uh, either use the raise hand function in the uh, reactions tab, or you could type it out uh, in the chat box, and we could read it out for you. So don't be shy. Um, I'm sure if you have any questions at all, Dr. Plump would be more than happy to uh, answer your question. Yes, definitely. Okay, we have one question here. Um, whether um, Is there an advantage at looking at vertebral bones rather than leg or thigh bones when studying bipedalism? It just depends on what you're looking for. So we have adaptations for bipedalism in all parts of our body. So we have it in the cranium, the spine, um, the hips, the knees, the feet, ankles, even our arms and, and hands. They're maybe not adapted for bipedalism per se, but they're no longer um, adapted for moving in the trees. So our, our evolution to bipedalism has drastically changed our skeleton. And um, there are differences in the lower limb the shape of lower limbs compared to chimpanzees that are bipedal adaptations. Yeah, uh, we have another question here in chat that I'll read aloud. Uh, thank you for an interesting presentation, Dr. Plump. Any findings that correlate to biomechanics, e.g. hunting, uh, gathering lifestyle of early quote unquote humans with spinal alignment, hence uh, probable incidence of discomfort or pain. And thank you again for the presentation. Um, so that's a good question. So we do have, Generally, the, the um, samples that I have are from humans from Iron Age right up to post-medieval. So we have um, different subsistence strategies, different types of activities, all correlated. The issue is that I don't have large enough samples of each to be able to really do a comparison. I'm hoping that once I continue this data and I get larger and larger sample sizes, that we'll be able to actually um, distinguish between groups and see if there is a trend with um, changes in subsistence strategy and activity with shape, vertebral shape, or maybe through time, um, things like that. So that that's an interesting question, something I definitely want to look into. All right, are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, survey? 
Kim, uh, are you uh, when uh, when you finally get to, the, to these islands? Uh, are you uh, do you see a um, an avenue for you to carry on this uh, this research direction? Uh, Definitely. So I have collaborators in Australia mm -hmm. um, that are in are collaborating on this project. So my plan is to start applying for large grants to be able to get it up and running. Pretty much everything is set to go, we just need funding. Right. And right. I'm excited to have access to different collections and what I've had so that to increase my um, diversity of the human variation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a very interesting uh upcoming project that I'm sure that many students at uh, ASV would be more than happy to uh, jump in. <laughs> I know I know uh, several of my uh, cohorts and uh, fellow students are interested in uh, in uh, bioarchaeology and, and human osteology, in fact, so. Uh, oh, fantastic. So I'll you. be teaching bioarchaeology this term. Yes. Yeah. And then hopefully, maybe next term, I'll be teaching a course um, on human health through throughout human history. Um, and I have a book coming out in April um, that in, integrates paleopathology with evolutionary medicine. It's really interesting. So if you look it up, it's called Paleopathology and Evolutionary Medicine and Integrated Approach. Um, if you are interested in the chapters, let me know and I'll send you a PDF of them. Okay, Sounds we have fantastic. another anonymous question. Um, how does lifestyle and behavior affect these underlying variabilities vis-a-vis -vis nature versus nurture? So there, there is going to be um, different activities that cause back problems. So with the disc herniation, um, if you pick up something heavy and you twist your body as you pick it up, so if you pick and twist, you're going to probably it's going to increase your chances of getting disc herniation so always pick up and then turn um so there are different things like that that can cause it um and we're definitely not saying that vertebral shape is the only factor we're saying that it's one of one of the main factors so whether if you pick up a box wrong it could be up to whether you have vertebral shape what your vertebral shape is whether whether you're more prone to get the, the damage or not um we haven't found very much um, when I say we, I mean anthropologists in general haven't found very much evidence that the shape of the vertebrae changes very much um, without pathology throughout a human life. Um, so typically the shape of your neural canal and the shape of your vertebral body stays the same um, with as long as there's no pathology once it's, uh, once it's fully formed in childhood. Uh, but the studies that have found that have been quite small. So again, that would be an interesting thing to be able to do once I have larger populations. Yeah, uh, there's a comment here uh, in the chat by uh, Bell, the one that posed the question earlier, and I'll just read it aloud. Uh, mm -hmm. Can't help but think that since we are a quote unquote sitting race, uh, more back problems are in our future since sitting puts a lot of compression uh, to our uh, intervertebral disc which also deteriorates with age and yeah i think that would be sort of a really interesting study mm -hmm. to compare us right Experience. now especially yeah yeah <laughs> so really to look at ct that's what i was hoping with the ct um with the individuals that i get their ct scans to get their occupation and, and an idea of how often they sit and stand and, and exercise the interesting thing is that there's there's a lot of factors that have been suggested to cause these back problems so anything from smoking to sitting, to um, uh, you know, gymnastics or exercise, gene pool, diet, um, biochemistry. Um, th for every one of those factors, there's there's a study that says yes, we found a correlation, and then there's another study that says no, we didn't find a correlation. So it that's why it's been so hard for for medical research just to pin down what's causing these these um, factors. So if you consider vertebral shape as the underlying factor, and if that's been ignored, not really ignored, but just unrecognized in clinical studies. Um, so you know if someone has the same diet, smokes and sits in the chair, two people are doing the same thing all the time. One gets back problems and one doesn't. The doctors don't know why. What you know it's the same factors causing both. So what's caused it? And it might actually be retrieval shape then. So both are do having those risk factors. They're both doing the risky behavior for back problems, but one has the retrieval shape that might actually cause you know 
a higher chance of developing it. Um, but interestingly, when you look at the prevalence of back problems in archaeological um, populations versus now, they're quite similar. So I don't think we can say simply that it's modern, um, modern factors that are coming into play for it. So sitting probably does. I mean, I know even right now I'm hunched over my laptop in a terrible way. And I can start to feel it on my back. Um, so it, it probably does, it doesn't help, but we've, this is something that we've been having problems with throughout, throughout human history, even before we were sitting all the time in, in office chairs and over laptops. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. good question. I, I think um, that's why it's, it's important to underscore that in your methodology, uh, you have to look at a, um, a population of, uh, uh, so vertebra from individuals from mm -hmm. the same population for, from the same time period. Because if mm -hmm. you only have one or two uh, in a cemetery, for example, it would be very difficult, really, to establish what's the cost of that. Uh, you just to, but you did mention biochemistry. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, my back problem was brought by uh, bio, you know, um, uh, white um, uh, multiple myeloma, you know. So mm -hmm. and that really reduced, and that's why I shrunk yeah. my three inches. So uh, and but that's hard. So there's so many variables that's possible. Then. Yeah, there's a lot, and there's a lot of different back problems that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a very complex problem. Okay, we have another question. Um, sorry, I have to translate it to English. Um, how how do you normalize your number of samples? Example, um, wherein. Uh, did you equalize the number of samples per species? And if there was a big difference, how did you correct for it? So um, there was not, there uneven sample sizes. That's a good question. With geometric morphometrics, the way that the um, populations or the way that the methods work, as long as you have an all right population or sample size, so over 10, 15, um, 20 for each group, Generally, they're, they're not that big of a problem, um, uneven sample sizes. And then when I run my analyses, so um, discriminant analyses or anything like that, I run, I cross validate them. So I run per permutations. So I, I run the test a thousand times and then take the average answer. Um, so there's a lot of different ways around uneven sample sizes. That's a really good question. But you definitely don't, you know, so with the hominins, um, I didn't run statistics on the hominin vertebrate because I only had two Neanderthal and two, you know, one Africanus and such. So that I just looked at in terms of distances and where they plotted on the graph. Um, I didn't bother running p-values or anything. So there is a minimum sample size that you need in order to make the statistics relevant. Um, but there are ways around balancing them in the statistics if you have une uneven sample sizes. Okay. And then I, in, I, oh, right, go, ahead. go ahead, JJ. Anyway, I was going to sort of jump off of that, uh, that answer. And in terms of uh, statistical uh, software that you use to, to, when you do sort of uh, have to account for, for significant numbers, what, what type of software do you use to, to do that? Um, so there's specialized geometric morphometric software that you can use. Um, I also use R and SPSS. Another question, since you mentioned allometry, is looking at sexual dimorphism necessary or significant in your study? I ask this as well because um, in, in my own research, I've been asked this a lot. Um, and I suppose in relation to back pain, because um, generally the idea that women are more susceptible to back pain and osteoporosis and, and whatnot. Yeah, uh, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the condition, whether whether males and females are are um, have different prevalences. Um, also it can happen with ancestry pools. So genetic pools. So there's different genetic pools that are most susceptible than others. Um, I kept both males and females of humans and non-human species in it because I wanted to capture all of the species variation. And previously when I have looked at sexual dimorphism in the vertebrae, um, the it wasn't consistently there wasn't a significant difference consistently so i don't think it's that that large once you remove size from from the data 
but that would be an interesting project for someone to look at if they wanted to investigate sexual dimorphic differences in vertebrates. Do we have any other questions? Maybe we can entertain um, a, a couple more. Perhaps uh, another um, general wonder is whether or not you've seen any implications on um, the sacrum or the, the articular surface with the um, uh, lum lumbar vertebra? Um, of the disc herniation? Sorry? Of the disc herniation, do you mean, yeah. or of the, yeah. It, it definitely can happen on um, the top of the sacrum or the bottom of the lumbar vertebra. So there are, there are discs there and it can happen. Generally, it happens more. They happen most in the lower thoracic upper lumbar vertebrae. Okay, um, I think that was a very productive uh, discussion. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Plum. Um, I would now like to hand the, this over to Anna uh, to close our Binalo Talks for today. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I think there's a lot of people who are still uh, uh, trying to digest your, the, your research and it's, uh, it covered a lot and it's actually very interesting, especially since uh, when it comes to, uh, I guess a lot of people are coming in uh, this research with from different backgrounds. So there's questions yeah. about back pains, there's evolution questions about evolution and how we're going to combine that with other research. I know that there are other people here who are uh, have are interested in doing the same research. Or, well, not generally the same research, but uh, are, are looking at uh, the looking at the the other parts of the body so uh and also looking at um non-human uh, uh samples and i think that's one of the things that we can actually expound here uh, especially when uh, you start your classes so for everyone uh there dr plump will be plump will be giving uh is you have a class on bioarchaeology, am I correct? So you mentioned that? Yeah, human osteoarchaeology. Yeah. Okay, human osteoarchaeology. It'll be lab based, so. Yeah, so uh, we'll be slowly, on that note, we'll, uh, ASP will slowly start opening uh, the classes. So there will, there will be some limited face-to-face. -face, so please watch out for that. Check out your emails and we'll also be putting the information on the website and also on the, Facebook page. So very quickly, uh, if you are a student of ASP or if you're interested in getting more of the announcement, please check both of those social medias. Uh, Dr. Plump, if there are any other questions, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are still uh, thinking about this. Can they also email you or contact you? Oh yeah, of course. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of other questions uh, that, uh, while people are still digesting. We're heading over to lunch, so that's the perfect time for people to start rethinking about diet and also uh, how they how how we are evolving with uh, uh, with our uh, postures. All right. <laughs> um, so for next week, Dr. Gay Laxina will be giving a talk. The title is currently. Uh, it's still be going to be uploaded, so please check out the Binalo, Binalo Talks announcements. Uh, Ara just, uh, and Dea just, Andrea just posted the uh, Facebook page here, so please check that out, and we will see you next week at 1 p.m. Manila time. And again, thank you, Dr. Plump. We look forward to seeing you next thank week. You. Uh, yes. uh, next, next, nice to see you. Next month, uh, yeah. And hopefully, you, hopefully next week. <laughs> hopefully next week. Uh, and thank you to our two moderators, Andrea Casalan and Arturo Tablan, uh, who are, uh, interestingly enough, everyone is in different timelines. Andrea is currently not in Manila, and uh, all of them are not in Manila. Everyone. <laughs> okay. uh, so, but thank you again, and we will see you all next week. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much.